Welcome everybody. This is the monthly market update. Here we go. What's up everybody? It is August 2022. Let's get the monthly market update. If you haven't checked out the podcast, Simple Passive Cashflow is where you find it. iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and check us out on YouTube. And we also record and put all these monthly market updates on the website at simplepassivecashflow.com slash investor letter every month for you guys to pull these reports and see if I'm lying or see if I'm right in my prediction. But if you guys want to ask any questions throughout or leave any comments, feel free to type it into the chat below on your perspective. The way you're watching it, we go out live on YouTube and our groups. Looks like we got a wandering dot. What's up, man? And uh, we also put this in the podcast form. So let's get started here. First article this is another one of Wallet Hub's top 10 places. And this is the best and worst places to rent in America. The best places was Maryland, Overland Park, Kansas, Sioux City Falls, South Dakota, Bismarck, Lincoln, Chandler, Arizona, Scottsdale, Arizona, Gilbert, Arizona. El Paso, Texas, Casper, Wyoming, Cedar Falls, Illinois, and Fargo, North Dakota. How I, they came up with those top rental markets or best places to rent. I guess this is in the perspective of a renter. I have no idea, but you guys seem to like these top 10, which is why we do them. The markets with the best vacancy rates are the Little Rock, Arkansas, Casper, Wyoming, Augusta, Georgia, Amarillo, Texas, and the Charleston, Wyoming. Affordable rents are in Cheyenne, Wyoming, Bismarck, North Dakota, Cedar Walls, Cedar Rapids, Illinois, Sioux City Falls, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Overland Park, Kansas. Moving on. If you guys haven't heard of it, it's like the second crypto winter. And this one's a little bit different. So what a lot of people were doing is they were putting their money into these crypto staking platforms such as like BlockFi or Celsius. I wasn't doing very many of these, nor do I do, I don't really do crypto. I don't really believe in, I believe in like the whole idea of cryptocurrency is getting away from governments, a controlling currency, which I'm all for, but I just don't really, I don't know. I think real estate is just way better and it's passive income, which you can typically defer the taxes on as opposed to this stuff, which the governments are going to be coming after pretty heavily on a little bit less because it all took a crap on everybody. And especially like that Luna thing, which I knew was a bad deal from the start. But if you haven't heard, Celsius is one of these big trading platforms where people would, they would stake their coins or whatever it's called. And they would get maybe like 9%, 15% on just staking it. But what people didn't realize what the heck that meant. And what it meant is like putting your coin up and then people borrowing it or you're putting money up for the borrowing platform to happen. And it was, it's like a house of cards is how I saw it. And eventually came down crumbling and Celsius has had to restructure. And a lot of people are asking me, Hey, I'm going to get my money back. And I tell people, no, man, you're not going to get your money back because that's why you don't invest in this stuff. Because in any investment, you always ask, how am I securitized? If shit happens, how am I going to get some or all of my money back? And in these types of situations, you don't because there's no underlying asset value. There's another deal going out out there where people are like, you're investing in like online businesses, but like the online businesses, there's not really worth anything. If anything, there's maybe some inventory, some useless junk that's in a warehouse somewhere that you can sell pennies on a dollar. But that's why I like real estate because it's always worth something, especially like the raw land portion. Of it. Sorry if you did this type of stuff. I guess I should have told you you should have done it, but I don't do this type of stuff. I maybe had $1,500 in BlockFi that I took out last month just to learn it, but I don't put a substantial amount of my net worth. If you, you follow what the high net worth people over $10 million do, they typically don't put anywhere. They put 1% to 10% of their net worth into things like this. It's all the lower net worth people that are dancing around with 10, 20% plus or their net worth. A real estate intelligent marketing reports that study finds that the U S needs 4.3 million more apartments by the year 2035. And I put this in there and I think a lot of us are very well aware of, which is why we invest in real estate. 
especially lower middle class workforce style housing is because there's a demand for it. It's a commodity and it's something that you can forecast the need for. The report says the U.S. has undergone tremendously difficult conditions that have fundamentally altered our nation's demographics. But one thing remains certain, there is a need and demand for more rental housing. The U.S. must build 3.7 million new apartments just to meet the future demand on top of the 600,000 unit deficit and a loss of 4.7 million affordable apartment homes. A major driver of the apartment demand is immigration, which, you know, if, if anything, immigration needs to occur more, especially if there's a supply chain crunch and China isn't supplying us with cheap labor. We've got to re a lot of these jobs. But anyway, that's just my interjection right there. The article ends and says California, Florida, and Texas will require 1.5 million new apartments in 2035, accounting for 40% of the future demand. Commercial property executive reports that YCRE, which is commercial real estate investors, are rethinking refinancing. And I actually had a webinar for my investor a couple of days ago. And if you want to get a copy of that, shoot us an email at team at simplepassivecashflow.com, where I went into this in pretty heavy detail. But from a high level, just for the podcast audience and the public investor audience here, basically what's happening, it's really hard to uh, get lending because the, not, the interest rates went up, but I would probably argue that the thing to point to is like these rate caps that we normally will buy, usually buy something where, you know, if we, we close at 5% interest rate, we want to buy a cap so we don't have to, if the interest rates go up to five and a half, we cap out there. So it's a way of being conservative, but it can be very expensive. In the past, it's costed us maybe half a percent, a percent of the loan value to pay for one of these things. And now it's, I would say like triple or even more expensive than it once was, which really impacts closing costs and the deals. So that's just speaking from my own personal experience, but reading what the article is saying here, during the first quarter, investors were eager to refinance in order to take advantage of high valuations to get into the market. Now, many are hesitant to tap the debt markets because interest rates have risen so much since March and the lender underwriting is reflecting economic uncertainty and increased risk. So we all know interest rates are going to be going up to tame inflation. I and mean, did the whole little diagram and chalkboard exercise on this whole dynamic along. And another thing I would recommend for you guys is go back in the podcast. I did a couple great podcasts with Richard Duncan. You guys can check that out at simplepassivecashflow.com slash Duncan. Multi-housing news reports the growing cost of capital for multifamily development. In this kind of piggybacking one I just mentioned, borrowing costs are 2% to 2.5% higher than a year ago. The result is a situation not seen in years in which the cap rates have fallen be below the cost of debt. But in fast-growing Sunbelt hotspots, huge population growth has created demand for multifamily housing far outstripping supply, propelling rent rates and leaving many longtime multifamily experts slack-jawed. The situation should keep cap rates low. So in other words, rents are continually to go up and up, which actually makes this a very good time to be buying real estate. This is a buyer's market in a little bubble as the large institutional investors have paused their buying, but they got to come back in at some point. I was argued before the end of the year. The only problem right now is in getting your lending set up or what we call capital markets, which has nothing to do with the cap rates, guys. Don't get that confused. So if you're an all cash buyer right now, this is an awesome time for you. It's just That's just never a good way to invest. In my opinion, you always want to be taking advantage of getting as much good debt as possible. The article ends of greater concern maybe whether the Fed will aggressively shrink its balance sheet, yanking a lot of liquidity out of the system. Less cash will be available at any price. Available capital will be insufficient to fund all development projects. That is just talking about like a doomsday scenario, but... Yeah, go back and uh, check out that that video we did, especially for you investors in our group. It is simple, and I think it what it does is there's a lot of the noise out there. Like I mentioned, don't watch these YouTube videos, these doom and glooms of these guys who sell newsletters or the people trying to sell gold, have them you buy through their affiliate links and stuff like that. And then get back to basics. And this is my book here. If you guys haven't checked it out. Really trying to get over 100 reviews. I think we're up into the 80s or 90s right now. 
Uh, the journey to simple passive cash flow, it, I've been told it does a very good job in teaching the basics. And the basics is number one, investing in good deals where you're investing with people with reputation and a track record to get passive losses. So you're able to play different games on your taxes. Essentially, stop doing the stuff that like your lame CPA is telling you, such as do your 4K or deferred comp plan that isn't really any tax advice. It's just deferring taxes. It's a play checkers or instead of playing checkers, play some chess with your taxes and pay little to no taxes by changing your color, your money from ordinary income to passive income. So you can use your passive losses from your real estate to zero that out as best as you can. And maybe even if you're uh, want to get jazzed up, do some rep status in there to all to, and then maybe do a little infinite banking. If you guys want to get more information on infinite banking, you guys can get the uh, info page at simplepassivecashflow.com slash banking. But uh, help me out and buy the book and spread the good work, folks. We'll continue on. Multi-housing news. How the housing shortage became a crisis. So the U.S. underproduced $3.8 million of housing between 2012 and 2019. The shortfall is double what it was seven years ago. The problem is exasperating itself by crumbling infrastructure, racial inequality, climate change, and climate events. And while undersupply impacts residents at all income levels, lower and residents of color suffer the most. Three root causes for this is missing households that would have formed if units were available and affordable, insufficient availability in uninhabitable units, which is why we like to invest in this type of stuff because there's a growing demand for it. And it's something that, you know, as new inventory comes online, it doesn't really directly compete with your class B or C asset. It, the class A stuff actually helps you because it pushes the price points up and up, which we have another article discussing that later today, but it just, you don't really have a direct competition. This is why I don't like self storage investing because even when you're you always want to buy class A type of storage because everybody wants to go to the 24 hour air condition, very highly secure using tech, a lot of tech in their self storage. But if somebody builds a new self storage facility next year, you're screwed. And that's why I'm not a big fan of that, that asset class. I do like bolt storage though, RV storage. Multi housing news also reports multifamily investing in a high inflation economy. So our economy has shifted to get from a manufacturing to a service based one. And we have a Fed that is very proactive with the arsenal of tools they have really deployed to manage economic growth. Again, if you this is all new to you guys, check out the info page at simplepassivecashflow.com slash Duncan. Great primer. And feel free to share that with your friends. The current high inflation environment with the prospects of higher treasury rates have led both investors and lenders to reassess their underwriting assumptions along with future valuations and cap rates. Combined with the uncertainty over ex exit cap rates in light of increasing treasury rates, multifamily investors are having to temper their pricing in order to achieve acceptable rate adjusted returns. And here's my quote in here. I've been seeing a lot of deals where they like are still assuming that rents are going to go up 3% every year and their exit cap rates are still pretty high or pretty low. The importance of relationships both on the debt and equity capital is paramount in order to access capital to take advantage of this temporary market dislocation. I talk about is right right now. It's currently in a little bit of a bars market. Like I said, if you're somebody who isn't the best investor out there, but hey, you have a lot of money and you buy stuff cash, this is the ideal situation for you. Still, I wouldn't rec. I wouldn't do it, but. Right now, the prices are a little low. It's just the only problem is lending. And there, you never have a time when things are always good and all signs clear. And you're always going to have some kind of way to things where there's always going to be seemingly headwinds in the way. If not, that's when the prices start to go away and which was getting there prior to twenty late 2021 or 2018, I would say. Thankfully, we had that whole pandemic thing. RE Business Online reports Redfin, a U.S. residential median asking rates of 14.1% in June on annual basis. Redfin is the big real estate, online real estate brokerage, uh, reported national rents in June went up 15.1% year over year. The June figure is a slight increase from May, which... So what I've been telling everybody, you know, rents are still aggressively going up. And this is another reason why it's a great time to be buying right now. 
the rent growth is slowing because landlords are seeing demand start to ease as renters get pinched by inflation. But I think this is the thing I always highlight for folks. Like, despite what you read the word recession, rents are still going up. It's just it's not going up at the crazy pace it once was, which is a good thing. I think that crazy pace was un unsustainable. All I personally want is a little bit of growth, like a 1% to 3%. Rents are still climbing at unprecedented rates in strong job markets like New York and Seattle and areas like San Antonio and Austin that soared in popularity during the pandemic. And here are the top 10 markets that saw the biggest jump in June. Cincinnati, Seattle, Austin, Nashville, New York City, Nassau County, New York, New Brunswick, New Jersey, Newark, New Jersey, Portland, and San Antonio. Yardi Matrix reports multifamily rents rise again in June. Yardi Matrix report average U.S. multifamily rents rose another nineteen dollars in June. Again, this is the same thing that we just mentioned. Increase was fueled by strong demand and rent growth throughout the country. So this is a different type of environment. This isn't like 2008. Lending is very different, in, on, at least on the residential side. You don't have the ninja, no doc, no job, no income type of loans. There's a lot of controls on lending, and that's what's bogging down future investor mojo is that the lack of the capital markets, lack of lending. Availability. It's not that the deals are too expensive. Uh, the expectation for the remainder of 22 is for rents to increase at slower rates as the economy cools off. But that doesn't mean that it's going backwards. It's, there's always one thing I always say if I were to bet that rents don't go down for very long, I would probably say what's long, maybe a longer than a six to 18 month period. It's just unfortunately for people who rent, it's always not going to come out of your pocketbook at the end of the day as gas prices raise, like the airlines just pass it off of their customers. And so things are going pretty well in, I don't know about the economy, but as far as if you're an investor getting your money working in real estate and in rentals, and it's going so well that like the class A multifamily units are doing really right now as wealthmanagement.com reports, rent growth will not materially slow down until demand cools vacancy ticks up and will happen if and when affordability becomes a headwind if the job market subsides. This is what why kind of my whole thesis is like if there's any type of trouble in the economy, any type of recession, who's gonna get hurt? People who own their own houses, they're gonna get foreclosed and where are they gonna go? They're gonna cascade down to class A apartments, class B apartments, class C apartments. This is right now you're seeing the class A apartments do really well because People can't afford to buy houses because the cost of their lending, their interest rates have gone up. So it's a cause and effect thing. And I think it's important to find those asset classes, those sectors, those those wealth gaps where you want to participate based on your set your viewpoint of the economy and how things work. And in my opinion, owning class C and B apartments in class B and A areas is where it's at. I know a lot of people like to buy these class A apartments. I'd say you might as well build them and sell it to suckers who want to buy them and operate them. I just, I think it's a sector that's really performing really right now because people cannot afford houses and they are just going to go and rent a $1,500 a month, $2,500 a month class A apartment. But don't see that really continuing or I see that as a catch up mode currently right now. So uh, here's an example of a class A apartment right here. The Capital Group or Communities Real Estate Department is divest of upland apartments in Kirkland, Washington for $242 million. So this is a class A apartment. And this is like a business plan that I would like to personally get into is like building these developments from scratch, creating a tremendous amount of value add, and then selling it off to a mom and pop syndicator who they have silly investors who really like these pretty pictures and that's how they sell their deals. But then this is, to me, that's the risk is operating these high-end apartments. Right now it's doing really well because a lot of people in houses cannot afford to buy the loans, the higher interest rate and their affordability is backtracking as of maybe a couple of months ago. I just don't see that trend continuing. And I think that there's some leveling off of it. And I just think there's just more long-term stability in the B class asset, one level below this type of stuff. But yeah, I want to do exactly what these guys do. Harbor, who is a direct Fannie Mae Freddie Mac lender, 
says that Fannie Mae Freddie Mac expects Mission to deliver liquidity, stability, and affordability. The agency is committed to enhance stability and affordability of challenged markets by providing greater liquidity over the next three years. So things tighten up in the capital markets and people aren't able to afford their super expensive houses because simply the cost of interest rates went up a little bit and that directly impacts affordability. And that impacts a lot of people on the fringes. And that's where the Fannie Mae Freddie Mac are saying here where they're rededicating and changing up their targets for the future lending. And this is always going to happen. It's just happening since the beginning when I've invested. They always make these micro adjustments and take another run at it. And things just keep continuing and keep continuing. This is why I always tell investors you don't really get too excited about any one thing. It's, there's always these small type of corrections here or there. And at least how I've seen for the most part, things typically work in a control band. And I think people get too much into the headlines, the normal garbage headlines from your C's, your Yahoo's that are placating out to the average consumer out there trying to just sell headlines of fear, doom and gloom. But this is what's happening on, in the more industry newsletters like this, which I try and find for you guys. They're looking to do increased loan purchase activity and foster loan product innovation to enable the use of manufacturing houses in unique development scenarios. Fannie Mae is one of the leading sources of liquidity for manufacturing and affordable housing. They're trying to work on the problem. So those of you guys who don't know, Fannie Mae Freddie Mac is your government arm, pseudo government arm and to get that money out there to the people who need it the most to buy houses because some people still think out there that everybody should buy a house to live in, even though that's not really going to happen, that they're trying to get the people on the fringes that sort of deserve it to get them over the edge, which I think is a good thing. Bloomberg reports from the billionaire Zell warns that the Fed needs to break inflation mindset, said he doesn't think that the U.S. is currently in a recession, but I'll try and, I guess I'll try and uh, summarize what I talked in my other hour half long webinar with my insiders in our group. But basically you have inflation at a all time, I don't want to say all time high, but a pretty moving average of 9.1% last I checked it, which is three times what they want it to be at most. They usually want it to be one to three. So what's going on is that you're seeing the Fed increased the amount of interest rate, which is called quantitative tightening. After quantitative easing is what they did previously, which is essentially creating fake money and creating all these government entitlement programs to basically lift us out of a pandemic created recession, uh, which I think is a good thing to do. And this is coming from somebody who really doesn't like too much government control, but I think that's what the government is supposed to do when the country shuts down. For several months due to a pandemic, we need a little bit of outside interjection of that stab to the heart of adrenaline to keep us going after a pandemic. And that's what happened. A whole bunch of money got pumped into the system, which is called quantitative easing. And then now it created a lot of, uh, it made everybody's stock market go up, easy come, easy go. And everybody's like house prices soared which is obvious, this byproduct of all this printing of fake money. And now we have to reverse a little bit because inflation is too high. Go figure. So this is exasperated by two things, which is the Ukraine war and the COVID lockdowns in China. So I'll dissect that a little bit. The, so the Ukraine war, what that's doing is putting some restrictions on the fuel. I think you guys, the Russian oil and stuff like that and it's coming things up there and the cold the covid in china most of you guys are probably wondering like y'all are still playing covid pandemic out there yeah we might be over it mentally in america but in china they're still doing that zero covid policy and even though it may be a little outdated and a little overboard at this point it is what it is political affiliations aside and don't matter like it's what china is doing and the result is that the people in china aren't in the factories giving us americans the cheap labor that we need to push our businesses forward which is creating a lot of issues in terms of supply chain which is also further exasperating the inflation and the relation that's happening there is if I'm a business owner and I typically use China labor or outside Asian cheaper labor outside that's effectively in a way better technology. So I don't have that at my disposal right now. And that dang Ukraine war is gumming up my operations. So these are the dynamics at play. So until 
either the Ukraine war ends or COVID in China lightens up a little bit, we're in this predicament where there's not going to be any outside relief. So the only the levers that the Fed has to pull is to increase the interest rates, which is to take away money from the system in a way to lower the inflation. And what they want to do is they want to keep doing this un until that unemployment starts to creep up. And this is the good news. Unemployment's doing really right now, guys. Like it's Google it. Unemployment in America. Look at the chart. We're like at all time lows right now. I don't know all time, but in our lifetime lows. Well, we want that thing. What the Fed is likely doing is they're playing their probably going to increase the interest rates half a percent, quarter percent. They're trying to get that inflation back down, but they don't want to do it too much so that unemployment goes up because if unemployment goes up, that's it's a that's a harder relation to fix at the end of at the end of it. But that's you start in, you injecting more in interest, taking money away from the system, but don't break it by having unemployment skyrocket over eight to ten percent. Now it's a it's a fine balance and it's also made a lot more difficult because there's slack in the system and there's more slack in the system than normal as there's so much liquidity reserves. So it's really hard to determine if the Fed increases the rates by 0.75 tomorrow. It's not, it's not like by next week, Wednesday, it's going to be unemployment will be this and inflation will be back down to 7% and we're well on our way to getting it under 5%. It just doesn't work like that. And that's what makes it difficult by the Fed. It's very simple relations, but and I use this analogy and other things, but it's like a cruise ship trying to turn back around. You obviously don't want an overcorrection, but too much government intervention. And, you know, in terms of too much interest rate hikes, we've still got a long way off to what, what where we were in what, 1985. And uh, we've got our Hawaii retreat that I'm planning in January of 2023. And I'm thinking of making it some kind of like a throwback to the 1985 era where we had 11% rates maybe basically just give people an excuse to wear really ugly hawaii aloha shirts but anyway if you guys haven't yet checked out our family office hana mastermind on the simple passive slash journey if you're tired of these free meetup groups with low net worth investors who aren't serious we have over 90 members in this group of course if you haven't checked out our what's kind of inside of our education platform you can join for free at simplepassivecashflow.com slash club. And uh, check out my book. You guys can download it for free at simplepassivecashflow.com slash book. Help me out. Buy a book. Leave me a review. I'm trying to get over 100 reviews on there. Uh, we'll see you guys next month. Bye. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.